This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It is a perfect summer's afternoon for a battalion to be soaring about in the heat waves that are coming up from the earth. It's a very different sort of afternoon than it was sort of morning. It was a very, very big change in the weather. It's a lot hotter and bright blue skies, though not a single cloud as well. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got Senzo and it is a very warm welcome to all of you on this beautiful Sunday afternoon from South Africa. I hope that you're all having a wonderful day night wherever you may be and I hope that you will engage with us for the duration of the afternoon. Remember you can do that by using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or at FC on the YouTube chat and hopefully it'll be a good afternoon we're going to go and try and see if we can follow up on where um Hosanna is and see what he's up to and whether or not he's still there from this morning i uh, did i say who i am senzo did i say yeah. did we i forgot i don't know I, so it's one of those afternoons the hornbills are making so much noise i forgot oh there we go well done Good Tristan, it's all hardwired in there. See, I, I think I've got something wrong with me because I can't even remember three seconds ago. I'm like a goldfish this afternoon. Hopefully it's not going to carry on that way. But anyway, so yeah, this morning we stayed with Hosanna quite a while after we, after the show finished. And between myself, Brent, Jamie and the trainees, we pretty much spent most of the day um, with them. And he managed to steal his kill back this, this morning. So he stole it back, then lost it, and then stole it back again and managed to hoist it up a tree before the hyenas really kind of got too much of it so he did lose a little bit of it but not much con all things considered i think those hyenas were so full from whatever else they ate last night that they just couldn't really actually fit too much more in and so he got lucky did hosana and that means we got lucky because now he should theoretically not be too difficult to find this afternoon well that's the theory anyway you know with hosana and it's not always the case he might sometimes give you a bit of a run around and kind of make you work a little bit but I think we'll be fine I'm sure he's still there like I said the trainees are the last ones with him and that was a while ago or well not that long ago about an hour ago they left him and he was still sleeping away underneath his tree very happy with himself I would imagine right now it's not too far from where we are so it'll take us a little bit of time just to get there but while we do that let's send you to one of my colleagues who is joining us this afternoon the ever entertaining and full of drama, James Hendry, so you can say good day to all of you. Good morning! No! I've made a mistake there. Let's pretend, let's start that again, shall we? Live, live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari on this Sunday afternoon. We are driving now down towards Chitra Dam, a very large waterhole where hopefully there will be some elephants having a drink. It has been very hot today. Uh, I think they said it was roughly 36 degrees Celsius out here, which uh, I think is about 95 or so. Yeah, 35 and 95, so just over. 29. What? Is it only 29 degrees? It can't be. It's much hotter than that. It's absolute rubbish. Anyway, ah, 32 and 89, there we go. Okay, we've got it straight. Now that was my fault, I didn't remember it. So we're on our way to Chitra Dam. Uh, please do talk to us, of course, using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. You can send us your questions, you can send us your comments, you can send us your insults if you'd like to. Can't promise we'll address them all, but you can still send them. Or you can use the chat stream on YouTube. We've got Craig Batman on camera today. That was his batish thumb flying past the lens like a vespa bat a little free-tailed bat perhaps i'm not sure what kind of bat he is and that's pretty much the housekeeping complete so now we can get on with our game drive interesting stuff going on with the hyenas and with the leopards today and hopefully those interactions will continue wait stop press we have our first animal. Oh, look, Craig. Impala. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see that these Impala are not in a good way. They really are not feeling very well, and that is because of the dry season. But what you can see is that there's a little bit of green flush on those bushes. And so the tough times, hopefully, are over. 
and what is eating is the black monkey thorn. Senegalia berkii. Beautiful. Now, David Gatambagitu is in the middle of a big storm, but I believe that he's opened the flap so that he can show you something well floating across the grassland. A very good afternoon and welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya. And from very small impalas, we're coming to huge animals, the elephants. My name is David, as you're sure. With me on camera today is Archie. Archie, good afternoon. Archie's fine and he's okay. And we have a very big storm that seems to be coming. If you look way out there in the background, apart from having Ellis, there's like a very huge storm. You can see the wall of rain out there. It feels a bit chilly for me as much as the temperatures are 80 degrees Fahrenheit and 27 degrees Celsius. But I think because of that rain there, it feels very cold for me. Remember, we love, or it's wonderful to get questions from you. And should you have any nice comments of the rain and the elephant together, send them through using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter as usual. Ahead of Ellis here, and I wouldn't know what they're thinking as they're anticipating the rains to come. I can hear the thunderstorms and I guess they can hear them as well. So what do you want to do? I just want to pull forward a little bit. There's one elephant I've seen, either it's missing one tusk, but also the trunk seemed to be short. Doesn't have a full trunk. And I want to just move a little bit close and find out what could have happened to it. Not that I would know, but these are things that will happen. Genetically, we got elephants that are born or do not develop or grow the tusks. We got some that are born with one tusk. And also we got others that are born without a single tusk. Now, all right, you relax. There's one just first the other way. We're going to show you in a minute. She just faced the other side, way out there. Okay, if you go to the one further. This one looks fine, the one close to us. Both tusks are intact, pulling the grass from the ground. They'll, have, they'll sometimes shake the grass to get rid of soil. And should there be anything else that they may not want in that munching or in that food, they'll also shake it and remove it. Sometimes you have seen frogs or some other amphibians in the grass as they pick them up. And the elephants are very, sm very smart animals. They will know it helps to shake the grass sometimes. Now, if at you pan to the left a little bit, to those three on our left, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Now, of those three, there's that one on the right. Okay, the big one, again, showing us his back. Turn around this way. So if you look carefully, her trunk doesn't seem complete. And it could be anything. It's very difficult to know. And I would imagine the vet doctors would have an idea of what would have happened. But my theories are, are, are just guessed. It could be anything. Then girl, do baby Ellis enjoy the rain? I would, do, I would say they do not. They're too small when it rains and I think the skins are quite delicate. And what should happen is they'll always go underneath their mothers and that way they're sheltered from the rain. So if the rain gets bigger and it's coming in different directions, elephants have been known either to read the signs of rain as they come and if it will be bigger than what they can do to shelter their babies, they look for huge trees or big thickets where they can always go under. Like the thickets we see in front of us, possibly they might move to those thickets to make sure they'll shelter the young ones from the rain. Too much rain and if it's going to be cold, will not be very good for the calves. It could easily give them something like pneumonia. And you can see this particular one doesn't have any tasks which would in indicate her age is definitely less than two years. Well, 
It's good to have seen my face, but I'm sure you'll see a face with a bigger smile always than mine. A very beautiful elephant, a baby. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the show. I am Sydney Fumulan Mikosi and I'm traveling with Dave, who is my camera operator. For your questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. I've already established a sighting, but it's very, very far at the moment. I just want to quickly get there now. I can see a huge head of the buffaloes rushing towards the Viotella pan. So those buffaloes were looking very thirsty. So they don't want to come to the Galago pen at the moment. I've just gone past the Galago pen. When I saw them from a distance, I thought they were going to opt for the Galago pen instead of the Viotella pen. But they've just decided to go towards the Viotella pen. So the sun is very hot at the moment. I'm sure those bottles are... So I am hoping to see the spotted cats during this drive today. So now let's go to the luckiest Tristan who's got the spotted cat. We do indeed. We've managed to catch up with Hosanna, who's, well, doing what I would imagine most cats are doing at this point in the day, because he is f very, very sleepy. You can see his belly is moving at a rate of knots, not only because he's full, but also because he's just trying to control his temperature. It's a very warm afternoon, and it's crazy to think that this morning we were all wrapped up in jackets and we're feeling a little chilly and that it's as hot as it is now. So he's heavily breathing at the moment just trying to kind of keep that body temperature as down as possible and he's found himself a nice little spot up against a log and you can see he's got his little footrest there so he's feeling very 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 comfortable with life at the moment isn't that nice now his kill is up in a tree like i was saying earlier and it's quite far from where we actually are at the moment why he's lying in this particular spot i'm not quite sure but his kill is kind of there's a little sort of dip where we are and it's on the other side of where that is in a sort of drainage line now if any of you were watching a few weeks ago when we had a very cool elephant sighting in the afternoon i think it was one of our safari lives that we did on foot where the ellies walked very very close it's exactly where we are with hosana which is quite cool so we're just in that sort of drainage section and he's kind of found a very nice tree to put it in. It's, it's going to be perfectly safe there from all of the scavengers that hang around, except for maybe his dad. His dad is one that he's got to worry about. But interestingly enough, this morning we obviously were following tracks all around the hyena den. As we kind of finished up here and handed over to, to Brent and Jamie, who kindly came and sat for a while during the course of this morning just to make sure that Hosanna didn't disappear. They got a, a notification that there was a male leopard that was crossing from Triple M um, or on Triple M and pretty much where we had been tracking that male leopard all day. So we were very close. I think he was still around all morning while we were driving around. Now who it is, no one is sure because there was, it couldn't have been Hukamuri in the, at the end of the day because he was actually all the way on Sylvan or at Sylvan, should I say, which is very far to the west. Um, and so whether it's Tingana's first little foray into um, Arethusa or maybe Mfakazi or maybe potentially even, you know, one of the others that hang around, it's, uh, we don't know. But maybe that explains why we didn't actually see it this morning is because it was a little shy and skittish and kind of just avoiding us as we went along. But it just goes to show that there is a leopard walking around. Now that leopard walked all the way from Zoe's up for Tele Access. Um, and onto Aubrey's, so quite something to think that there is another leopard that's moving around if it's not Tingana. Anyway, we're going to spend our afternoon with our lazy boy, and while we do that, though, let's send you across to Sydney, who's got something that is not being very lazy at all at the moment. You can see now the buffaloes, they've just decided to start running. One of them gave an alarm call, like, 
and they all just decided to run away. I'm not too sure if they have spotted something dangerous here in the area. I'm just waiting for all of them to go past so that we can go behind them, following them to the waterhole. We might be lucky and see what they were complaining about. Now I can see the last two uh, crossing now at the road. I am going to push further and see if we can get very close. Some of them are still very far. I can see there, but a lot of them has crossed already. So I think now we have got an opportunity to pass and go to the water hall. Maybe it's lions or maybe they saw something small such as snake which frightened them and decided to run because there are no sign of the predators here where I am. So these animals, they are much more gifted. They can sniff from very far and they can hear from far. I am not too sure if they heard the lions or any other predator. So I can see some of them are still running towards the water hole. But there was a very loud alarm call given. They didn't just run away. First, one of them gave a warning call, which gave the other ones signals in order to run away. So now let's go to James, who got some very interesting things by the Chitwa Dam at the moment. What we have here at Chitwa Dam is a pied kingfish. It is not fishing at the moment. I think it's probably investigating the nesting site that it has used before in the bank over here. Can you see him there, Craig? So we can't see him there, but the nest that he had is just, if you go over the top of my right shoulder, there's a hole in the bank there, and we've seen them nesting in there. You can see there's quite a lot of dung around there as well, guano. That's not from the kingfishers, I don't think. I suspect that that is mostly Egyptian goose. And I wonder if there isn't an Egyptian... No, you know what it is. It's quite possibly hardy dar. There must be a nest there somewhere. I know that there was a nest in one of these trees, a hardy dar nest before, but every, all those little chicks seem to die, I'm afraid. Anyway, now we'll see if they try again here at Chitwadam. We do also have a lot of hippopotami. There are the hippopotami. In the last bits of water. I must say, this dam's getting pretty shallow. I think you'd be able to wade just about all the way across. Lots of places where the hippos can stand. Though all of those hippopotamus there are standing. They are not floating. So it gives you an idea of how shallow it is. Still a long way to go before this dam dries up. But it does accumulate. The kind of loss of water accumulates over the years. So unless we have a pretty wet year, it won't recover, if you know what I mean, into the wet season. Now, there's something very odd going on on the far bank there. Craig, all of those blacksmith lapwings are over there. There are about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 blacksmith lapwings. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, they're not supposed to be like that. They're quite territorial birds. And they nest in pairs. And so I have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Yes, they are having some sort of convention, Mary. What sort of convention it is, I'm not really sure. I'll try and do a bit of research into exactly what kind of convention is going on here while you go to a buffalo convention. Oh dear, what's going on there? Huh. 
How very interesting. Possibly a little scuffle between a young bull and a cow. And suddenly in the air there is the smell of hippopotamus dung, which of course must cover the floor of this waterhole. Alrighty, let's now go across to all the buffalo having all the water. So the buffalo has just arrived now by the Viotella pen. I can see a lot of them are drinking at the moment. Some are still waiting to have a chance. Some of them are also right deep in the dam trying to cool up their body temperature. Some of them are also standing under the trees. It is quite very hot at the moment here where I am. Some are just playing in water here. So if you can look at the conditions of these buffaloes, you can see that the bush is very dry but not yet showing any impact when it comes to the nutritional status because these buffaloes are still looking very good. They are in a very good condition. So they must be feeding on a lot of dry grass and drinking a lot of water. Rosalind, the Cape buffaloes, you can easily stop them. All you've got to do is to keep a distance. You know, animals, they don't just charge. They first consider the distance between you approaching and where they are. If you approach to a distance of about 100 meters, all these animals are going to be comfortable with your presence. If you trespass that 100 meters, let's say, and you go to about um, uh, 80 meters, meters you will be getting very much close and that animal is going to take a decision it means at 80 meters is a critical condition where anything can happen however when the buffalo is charging you have got to reverse and give them a space but if you are on foot you must have to stand still and if there is a nice barrier you must have to consider a barrier and if you are you are with the Game scout who is there responsible for your safety, he will then give you directions and deal with the situation. It's one of the very much dangerous animals when on foot. So you can see now that the ox pickers has also arrived some of them are now jumping on top of these buffaloes. When they got here, they were not escorted by the ox -pexers. They have just arrived while the buffaloes are here already. I'm so very much impressed with the condition, the health status of these buffaloes. You can see some of these ox -pexers right there on the side. It looks very, very hot at the moment. That is very true. Normally, by this time of the day, is when buffaloes are hiding in the big dongas. The very big, open, dry riverbed is where they hide, where it's nice and cool, and also in thick bushes. So they normally come out for drinking somewhere just before the sunset. It's too early for them to show up these activities. Maybe the problem now is that some of the dams are starting to become very dry and they are traveling long distances from one dam to the other. So this is what is called a breeding head. It is consisted of the females, males as well as the little ones. So the buffaloes do have two kinds of structures. Sometimes you will see only the males. They can form a group of bachelor head together, feeding together, and still go back and join the head. And they don't mind even walking just by themselves. So now, while still waiting for any developments here, let's go to Tristan, who is still by the sleepy cat, Hosanna. Indeed, he's very, very sleepy at the moment. And like I say, I don't think we're going to get too much from our young boy just yet. I think he's going to, unfortunately, probably have a bit of a nap 
for quite some time. Like I say, I'm quite loving the fact that he's got his foot up, or well, he's got two feet up on at the moment on this fallen over stump, and he looks very comfortable, doesn't he? I'm sure he's doing that because he can get a bit of a breeze on his tummy that will just help cool him down, but there's the back paw and the front paw, both perfectly poised on his log, making him feel very comfortable, I would imagine. Just now, at one point, he had that leg completely stretched over that log, and it was as though he kind of was flexing his leg out, and he looks very, very, very kind of relaxed and as though he was reclining at a swimming pool on a Sunday afternoon. I suppose if you're a leopard, it's about the right time of day to be sleeping and taking it very easy. And in weather like this, I'm not surprised. He's got a meal, he's had a busy morning, and so it makes sense that he wants to have a bit of a nap. But I'm very chuffed for him that he managed to get his kill back, if it was his, and was able to get food. So, Nico Nico viewers, what's the breeding rate of leopards? Depends on the area that you're in. Um, depends on um, how dense the uh, population of other predators there is, what food availability there is, um, water, uh, all of those kind of things will dictate the amount of cubs that they have. But generally you'll find in terms of a success rate in, in this particular area that we operate, you'll find that most of the time the Cubs will kind of be, it's about a th one in every sort of nine, ten that actually makes it to a full grown territorial adult, which is not very many at all. Um, obviously, that number could jumps up and down depending on the seasons and, and, and those kind of things, but it can go as many as three out of every ten, but generally, it's one out of every ten cubs actually makes it to adulthood and becomes a territorial individual, whether it be a male or a female. So, the success rates are not very high, and that's because in this particular area, very high density of other predators. So lion, hyena, uh, um, high density of male leopard, which is probably the number one cause, well not probably, it is the number one cause of fatalities within leopard cubs. Um, you've got snakes, you've got um, those kind of things that cause a lot of issues, um, even birds of prey. Um, and so you, you find in this area, cubs are quite tricky to raise to adulthood. And other parts where there's probably less, um, if there's areas where there's no lions or no hyenas, then they'll have a much easier time of it. But generally in those places, their biggest problem then becomes um, loss of habitat and, and human interference where their cubs will then get killed. So, you know, it just depends on, on the area. Um, but in this particular section, between one and three cubs out of every ten generally survives. And how often they will breed is always dictated by whether or not their cubs survive. If they have cubs that die before you know they become independent, you'll find it will take the female probably you know a month or two until she's actually starting to mate again, and then it's a three-month gestation period before she'll then give birth. So often when they lose a set of cubs, it's normally about five six months until they have their next set. If they have cubs that go independent, well, often they're mating before that cub goes independent, and they're the ones that are actually forcing that cub out, sometimes even when they're already pregnant, and Tundi was a prime example of that. She had cubs and then pushed them out um, as they were kind of as he was getting a little bit older and she was already pregnant. Right, so we're going to keep sitting with him, but while we do that, James and Brady Leave has got something very interesting. We have a really astonishing sighting here. There's a side-striped jackal. There it is in the shade. It's not the best picture of a side-striped jackal you'll ever get. But it's, it's made a friend. A waterbuck bull. They seem to be entirely comfortable in each other's company. Of course, the jackal poses no threat to the enormous waterbuck bull. And the waterbuck bull obviously feels no threat from the jackal. But why they should have chosen to lie in such close proximity, I couldn't really tell you. Other than to say they found some shade, it got too hot, and they thought, well, you know what, it doesn't really matter. We don't mind each other necessarily, so, well, that's fine. We'll just stay together. That is very funny. Isn't that gorgeous? Now we don't often get to sit with these jackals because mostly they're running away from us. They're quite skittish and so to find one that has been basically cooked by the sun is quite nice. It doesn't want to move out of its nice cool shady patch and so it's going to put up with us for the next little while.
Yeah, Linda, you say what a great tick. It absolutely is a great tick. The side striped jackal. Now, I suppose for those of you who don't know jackals, jackals are much the same ecologically as coyotes. They live singly and in pairs. The side stripe often singly, the black backed normally in pairs. And they are predominantly scavengers, although they catch a lot in the way of rodents and they will certainly eat things as widely varied as lizards and carrion, like I said, birds if they can catch them, nestlings especially. And I think they'll probably even take the old scorpion. And the side striped jackal is known for eating fruit. Not exclusively, but it does eat quite a lot of fruit in comparison with the black backed. Ah, now I believe you saw a jackal with Tristan this morning. That's very interesting. Thank you, Umkar, for reminding me of that. Was it a side stripe or a black backed jackal that you saw this morning with Tristan? Does anyone remember? Ah, and it was a black-backed, which in theory should be slightly rarer in this area. Now, when we came driving along here, we saw the waterbuck bull and we saw it with a little one and we thought, oh, that's odd, it's a, it's a waterbuck calf lying with a, with a bull. And then we stopped and realized that, uh, no, actually, they're not related at all. We have the wolf-like side-striped jackal and, of course, the big waterbuck bull, neither of whom seem like they want to move an inch today. I don't blame them. Sunday afternoon in the sun. Be very nice to have a little bit of a snooze in that shade myself, I feel. Don't worry, I'm not going to. I shall keep searching around the place. Well, Fiona, yes and no. I mean, jackals and foxes are related in so much as they come from the same family. So they all come from the Canidae, or the dog family. And so do coyotes, so do wolves, so do uh, African wild dogs. But I don't know how closely related they are, so what I shall do is open my book and I'll tell you. Right, so they all come from the order carnivora, which is the taxon up, or the group up from the family. And then they all belong to the Canidae family, but they don't all belong to the same genus. So the African wild dog belongs to a different genus, but the jackals, side-striped, black-backed, Ethiopian wolf, the European wolf, the grey uh, the wolf, all belong to the genus Canis. And you'd probably find that they could interbreed, or certainly they could hybridize. But when you get on to the foxes that we have here, the bat-eared fox, the royal fox, the fennec fox, the cape fox, and the pale fox, and the rupels fox, and the red fox, these are all African foxes, they belong, all of them, but for the bat-eared fox, to the genus Vulpes, V-U-L-P-E-S. And I suspect that the European versions belong to the same genus. And the bat-eared fox has its own genus. It's called Otocyon, which is interesting. So, they do not belong to the same genus as most of the other dogs, the foxes. Uh, the jackal is much more closely related to a domestic dog, or probably even an African wild dog, and certainly a wolf than it is to any of the foxes that we have. It's a rather long-winded but relatively detailed um, explanation of their relations to the other canids. Oh, he's got something. He's eating something. He's got something quite nice to eat there. Oh, that looks disgusting. Oh, yeah, you can probably hear the game drive radio going in my ear. It's deeply irritating. Definitely got a nice piece of meat. Alrighty, well, 
we're going away from this dog over to some cats. The cats are not close by here. They're far, far, far away in the rain. Well, that must be a very big party, Jackals, Nyalas, and now Guinea hens. That's huge. We may be having what could have been a big party here a few minutes ago. We got the sausage trip right, and you can see all those females there with the cubs, with the young ones, and they were trying to bring down, or they gave a shot to bring down a buffalo. Let's have a quick look on this one, as close as Arch can go, and if you look at her closely, you can see she's panting, and on the shoulder, you can see some blood spots. You see that panting there? It shows definitely she was in a big action a few minutes ago, and the blood on the shoulder there, the front side, because her and the other members of this pride of lions tried to bring down a huge buffalo. But what is interesting, as they were just about to choke it or to suffocate it and kill it, the other members of the buffaloes, the other big herd, mobbed and ganged up together against these sausages, excuse me, on my head, and you might be going to show you now where those buffaloes are at the moment. And you're going to see how big that herd was, and the one that was attacked and survived is in that herd. I just want me to move forward a little bit so you can see them from there. Very good. Now, it is in this herd, which I think most of them are bulls, males, that there's one in the middle that have survived and will have a story to tell. Because shortly before, he was suffocated to death. All these others that you see here came and rescued it and got it out of the teeth or the mouth of the sausage tree pride. I'll be going a little bit close to them. I thought first I'd show you the lions. And then I'll be going close to this herd of buffaloes to see if we can zero in on the one attacked. Eligal, that's a very interesting or good question. The, the cubs of the subject trade are here. And what happens when the lions Eligal go to hunt, they'll always stay back. Of course, very quick message is sent to the cubs by the mothers. Stay put, stay still, don't move. And then the mother move. But after the aborted hunt, the cubs have rejoined the mothers. Let's have a look at them. See if now they could be playing and telling the mothers, well done, you did very well, you didn't make it. But chances are, on the next hunt, you'll definitely bring a buffalo down or another prey. Now, Eligal, if you look carefully, from a distance, you can see those two cubs there being very playful. And the mother is keeping a very close watch on them. Remember, your questions are always very welcome. Any nice comments, like from Eligal, please send them using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And for those who have never joined us before, this particular Pride of Lions is called the Sausage Tree Pride. Kalina, great comment. I mean, it's always a question of safety in numbers. And either way, as much as lions know that buffaloes is good prey for them, they also know the dangers they face. We have been having the migration for the last couple of months. We have been, you know, thousands and hundreds of wildebeest around this area and zebras. All of them have gone further down south to Tanzania to Serengeti National Park. And the season now that we have is what we call a green season. And green season means the lions have to look for bigger prey to hunt. Buffaloes, giraffes, elands, some big, big animals. So they know, you know, the, the, the risks they face. And Kalina, you're right. It was very nice for the buffaloes to come back. I just got there and missed it by a few minutes. And they just mobbed and rescued one of their own. So what I want to do is maybe go close to those buffaloes and see if we can identify that one particular one because I think he is still bleeding to me and actually if you allow me we're gonna move on and see how close we can get to those boys. Well I'll get close there but from my buffaloes in the Mara Triangle 
let's send you to other buffaloes in Juma in Kruger National Park. From the buffaloes in the Maasai Mara to the buffaloes here, you can see our buffaloes, because of the temperature at the moment, they are very much relaxed now at the waterhole. A lot of them are done drinking, I can see now, it's just about having fun. They are by their swimming pool now. Nekoniko viewer, both of them are very dangerous, hippo and the buffaloes. The hippos can be very dangerous, specifically if they find you between them and the water hole. That is when they can be dangerous. But the buffaloes, these ones, problem is when it's too hot, they've got to find a nice shade. And if you come there not seeing them, and if they see you from a long distance, we're not aware that they are there, is when they're going to give you a problem. So if you can check the hippopotamus, it's one of the animals who attacked quite a lot of people in the world. So in terms of the group of mammals, hippopotamus is the first group leading when it comes to the killing of people around the world. But the biggest animal, the animal who's killing the people the most is not the hippopotamus nor the buffalo, is the mosquito. Mosquito also falls under the kingdom Animalia. Insecta is just a class. Trish, uh, that is a lovely comment. At least these buffaloes had something to drink, considering the season at the moment and the enough water availability, buffaloes are in a very good condition. Toby, the buffaloes, they are ruminants. The ruminants are those animals which has got four chambered stomachs. Some other people, they call it a compound stomach or a complex stomach. They've got a rumen, a, a rumen, they've got a rumen, omasum, ab omasum, and a reticulum. So a rumen is a big portion whereby these animals are eating and saving the food which is then later on taken back to the mouth and be eaten again which is a process called rumination also is called to chew some card. So unfortunately buffaloes they are part of the Arithiodactyla. Arithiodactyla is a group of animals who are forming part of the ruminants. James, the little ones, indeed, they look like American cows. Also, the South African cows, they look similar like the baby buffaloes. So now when they've got the buffalo, the little ones like this is when they can be very dangerous if you go towards them on foot. So most of feeding is taking place at night. During the day is just their time to relax. As soon as the sun goes down is when they concentrate a lot on feeding. So these animals, they look very big, but they can go very, very fast. Act zero, the reason why the buffaloes are now standing in the water is that they are already done with their drinking. Now it's about cooling the body temperature. So if there were a lot of mud here, we're going to see quite a lot of males as well doing the mud wallowing in order to have the mud and cover their body to prevent the sunburn. So now from the buffaloes, let's go to Tristan. Tristan is still with Osana.
I am indeed still with Hassan and you can see very little has changed. We've had vehicles come and go and still our boy has been sleeping as, well, almost as though he's dead really. I suppose it's a very tough time to be, I'm sure he's going to move shortly though, funny enough. As you still see on his right, or well, he's on his shoulder area, the sun is hitting him properly now so it's starting probably going to get quite hot on that shoulder area and on his head and you'll find when that happens then often they do move and you might just get up and move a little bit closer to where we are um, there's a nice shady block that's kind of between us and him that he might just kind of go into there you go you can see the nice shady section I wish that we had a bit of shade ourselves unfortunately our shade is also disappearing very quickly we're starting to also get into the sun a little bit which is not as um, pleasant as I would have hoped for. I was hoping the sun was going to just come down a little bit to the left in which case we would have been perfectly aligned for some shade but alas Hassan has positioned himself perfectly so that he can get the best shade possible. Now there's not really any other way to kind of view him. From the other side there's almost impossible to get to him. There's lots of tamburtis on the other side so we're just gonna have to be patient and wait for him to move. I think you know it's already cooled down quite a lot considering um, well, compared should I say to, to to what we had a little bit earlier so I'm pretty sure it will be okay just now and to, for him to wake up and move around I'm hoping before the end of drive he decides to show his face and maybe go and have a little feed on his carcass and it'll take him a little bit of a walk to get there but I, I would imagine that he's only going to really feed as the Sun goes down I don't think he's really going to go up before then I think he's going to enjoy his nap and like I say it was a busy busy morning for him we know that last night he was at a fairly busy night he got bored and played the terrapins and then from there he somehow magically flew to Philemon's dip it was quite funny this morning because we were all looking for him around Gallego Pan kind of weird cellar pan area that northern side and don't know why for some reason I thought I'll just come check down near Philemon's dip in case he somehow got this side but and no one expected him to be a, you know when I spoke to Herbie afterwards he said he didn't see any tracks I didn't see any tracks for him either and how they managed to get this side I'm pretty surprised so anyway he did and we got lucky with the vultures if it hadn't been for the vultures and then hyena walking past when it did I don't know if we would have found him to be honest it would have been a lot trickier and this kill would have not have been easy to find now where he's put it so we got lucky and I suppose a bit of luck is always a good thing especially when it comes to leopards and we've had a tough kind of day yesterday and um, you know this morning wasn't going very well at all until we got lucky late in the morning so all good for now and hopefully he's going to keep this kill I'm hoping that his dad somehow doesn't sniff it out and find it grilled sushi well the reason why cats like to be clean is because they got OCD so they they like to make sure that every little bit of dust is off them in case the cameras come around and make sure that they are looking good for the paparazzi that arrive every day twice a day it's part of the contract that they sign when they join us is that they have to basically groom their coats every single day and make sure that they're clean and, and tidy you know we've got we've got a few other members of our staff that are the ragged kind of looking fellas and so we don't need to worry too much about that we need some clean well-groomed cats and so part of the contract says that they've got a sign on the dotted line as to to make sure that they clean now for the reason why they clean well from the pure point of view that most of what they eat is meat and that means that they get bits of blood and, and things on them which mats their fur and that can cause disease it can cause attract flies it attracts um, parasites and so to keep themselves clean means that they avoid having an overdose of those particular parasites and irritations in their life so if they have blood all over them they're going to just be bothered by flies all day long whereas if they clean their coat meticulously and, and they make sure that they're well groomed then you're going to find that they are not going to be bothered nearly as much it also means that their fur itself stays in a healthy condition um, if it's covered in blood all the time it's it's going to start to you to stick together and it's really not going to be very pleasant at all and they're going to smell very bad that's going to alert prey animals to them so it's all about just making sure that they're nice and clean and well groomed so that they don't get any little parasites all over them what have you seen there since 
just him and his coat. But you can see Hosanna is in beautiful condition. Very few ticks on him, or we can't see too many. There's one or two little flies that are on his coat at the moment, which you would expect. Um, they're landing all over us as well, and that's more because we're sweating that these flies are landing on us. We've got a few stingless bees and a few biting flies that are trying to get the salts and the liquid off us, whereas with him, you know, it's probably due to the fact that there's maybe a few little bits of meat on them. But generally, that's the reason why, is that they need to maintain a very clean coat um, for one, to stop, like I say, parasites, and two, to be able to not smell bad and still be able to hunt fairly good. Now, you would think that he's having a fit the way that he's breathing, but shame, he's getting hot now because his whole head is in the sun. Hosanna, all you have to do is just move one meter and you'll be absolutely fine. But alas, he's not going to. Anyway, we're going to wait for him to move. I'm pretty sure he will. And while we wait, let's send you across to James, who's got a, two of the biggest animals we get out here. Yes, we've got an entire herd of elephants over here. Now, I went on a little training drive this morning, and we noticed a couple of large cambritum trees that had been pushed over. Now, while we've been sitting here, this large cow in front of us has pushed over yet another large cambritum tree. She hasn't pushed it all the way over, but she's pushed it over enough to expose the roots. And clearly, there's not a lot of greenery around just yet. And so the trees, their roots, bark and stems are still taking a bit of a hammering. She's also very, very heavily pregnant. Hello, my dear. Very nice to see you. I hope you are not insulted. Look at this. This is, this is special. Watch this. Too big. <laughs> I think she decided it was just a little bit too large. She gave it a bit of a test. The one in front of her, not so much. I'm just going to keep my voice nice and low because she's pretty close to us. Investigating each branch of Combretum. There we go. That's quite a... Difficult one to get out the ground. That's it. Well done. Now I think if she could, she'd go for the root rather than just that little bit at the end there that used to be attached to the root. I'm just watching her belly as well to see if there's any sign of a kicking fetus. She breaks it on her tusks. Well, you see, MGN, this is possibly not a serious comment you've made, but maybe it is. They are a natural deforestation project, and without them, this landscape, as I keep banging on about, would look completely and utterly different. They are ecosystem architects or keystone species. She's not showing any sign of discomfort with us, so I'm just going to sit here while she walks a little bit closer and has a look. She's smelling Craig's haircut, not haircut, his shampoo. I think she likes it, Craig. The wind's blowing straight over the top of us onto this beautiful, beautiful elephant. This is so special. She's only about three meters from us, nine feet or so. showing any signs of discomfort. Look how prehensile the tip of her trunk is, if you can. She was just trying to pull a strand of bark off that branch. I mean, can you imagine how difficult it must be keeping a body this side fed in conditions like this? Now, she is definitely pregnant, and Kathy, that situation will remain as it is for about 22 months. So they'll have a gestation period of just under two years, which is a very long time to be pregnant, I imagine. I, I mercifully, no matter how I try, will never be pregnant myself. 
And so I cannot comment on whether or not a two-year gestation is a trial or not, but I imagine, given what I've heard people say about the nine months that we have as human beings, it probably is quite trying. She's just letting out a bit of gas, and now we have her youngster. The reason you've got bits and pieces of car in the way is that I don't want to move with them so close. They've been so trusting of us that I don't want to make a nasty noise. And now she's moving the other side. A brilliant question from a Japanese viewer watching on Nico Nico. Yes, the answer is they would eat a little bit of tree if the grass was green. Look, there goes a, there goes a big Combretum big Combretum tree right down. Isn't that amazing? That's just fantastic. I'm sorry we're not in a better position. I can move now. Let me just keep answering that question. So the grass will go green and they will almost universally then, yes, select for grass. But they will still eat some leaves and they'll certainly go for fruit. Get into a position where we can see which bit of it she's eating. There are trees coming up, so I'm just going to stop here. Now you can imagine, with the 15,000 elephants odd that there are in the Kruger National Park, all of them, or all of the adults, pushing over trees like this from time to time, you can imagine how they are modifying this ecosystem. Now some people see that and they say, oh, the elephants are destroying the trees, we can't have that. Well, the elephants are probably just opening up habitat for other creatures. Look at that big piece of root she's chose. There we go. It's like a really tasteless carrot she's now eating. FRG, elephants don't go long without water. In fact, I think there's actually some statistic on that. Which two days or so before they start to really struggle. I seem to remember reading it. If you just give me a, a minute or two, I'll see if I can retrieve it. Unfortunately, not from my brain, but from my very impressive mammal application. Here we go. Let me have a look. Description. No, we know what they look like. They are large and grey. Skull, no. Reproduction, reproduction, no. And Google says four days without water. I wouldn't necessarily trust that. This app that I have has got some very impressive research in it. Give me, a, give me a minute, and I'll just quickly, quickly have a look. See. Lots of interesting information here. Habits. 200 millimeters. I just remember reading a sentence which very nicely described it. It might not be. Here we go. 200 liters in the drinking session. Water holes right there. Every third or fourth day they will drink in really, really dry conditions. Now maybe we just have to say every three or four days. They probably could go slightly longer without then, maybe five days. But they'll try and drink every day if they can. I think it's unlikely that these elephants are around here by accident. I think the fact that we're so close to Chitwa Dam probably means that they're going down there on a regular basis. Wonderful. She's now opened up a whole uh, sort of resource of tasteless carrots for her friends. 
Right here, it would seem that the sausage tree pride's attempt at the buffalo have not ended yet. They seem to be about to make another approach. Well done, James, with Ellis. And Ellis happened to be my favorite animals because elephants will never bore you. They'll always be doing something. Now, back to the sausage tree pride here in the Mara Triangle in Kenya and that's from a distance you can see it very well that's what lioness that's walking slowly towards this herd of buffaloes now the buffalo I was talking about is in the midst of this group now I've been looking closely at them and I think this is a bachelor herd one major difference between females and males when it comes to the buffaloes it is the size of horns the males have much bulkier, heavy horns, and we shall say, if you look at them carefully, they got like a boss. Now, you see that one to our right. Look on the nose very carefully. It got a very bloody nose. Left, bottom left of your screen. And this is the buffalo that has a story to tell. And two of the lionesses, I would guess, or one of them was trying to suffocate it and then maybe two or three were just trying to hug it down from the back. But shortly before that happened, the main group came and rescued it. Well, for me, it looked like it got a bleeding nose. But I'm imagining those are all the teeth marks or how deep the teeth went in. Because lions know once they suffocate these big animals, that's always an easier way to subdue them and bring them down to death. Now, what I would guess would happen much later on, the other buffaloes might not want to stay very close with this particular one. Let's see if he turns back. Look on the back there, and you can see the hindquarters, especially below the tail. It's all bloody. And that is a typical formula for lions to bring their prey down. Bring it down from the back and then try to suffocate it. And Elijah, lions are pretty fast cats, and lions can comfortably do, I would say, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. But the females that we had here did not give a very good chase, I guess. And what, what could have happened is there was no male to help them to bring down the buffalo. Buffaloes are big animals, and they're very strong, and lions know if... They're not very careful. The buffaloes can easily hurt them with their horns because the horns are very solid. And I think the moment the lionesses realized all these buffaloes are coming, the best bet for them and to play safe, they had to let go. And that's exactly what happened. We'll now move on slightly bit down and see whether you can see the back or the hindquarters of this particular buffalo one more time before we go check the lions and find out if they want to come close to this particular buffalo. He is walking down and if you look carefully, he... Sorry, um, come again with that question for Roshni. Roshni, yes, I mean, that particular one looks strange in every way you would think of. If you look on the left side, he got so much mud, which is a bit grayish, and buffaloes will always mud wallow to keep cool, and sometimes to suffocate any insect or parasite that they could have on their body. But either way, he doesn't seem to be similar to the rest of the herd. As you say, he looks a bit strange. I would agree with you. And that's the one closest to your screen. And I'm sure, yeah, that one on to push it away. Or he's just trying to look and smelling the bloody bottoms. Giraffe girl, always a pleasure to hear your name. And you'd like to know if the pride will give a shot to this particular buffalo again. And I'll tell you a big yes. 
a big yes because the moment it has been attacked like this, it has weakened and these other buffaloes may not want to be with him. And the lion snow, he is not the same buffalo and not as powerful and his muscles are not as good maybe to fight back. So I got a feeling either later tonight or early tomorrow morning, these lions will slowly and quietly try and give another shot to this particular, I would say, poor buffalo. Yes, that's it's very possible, Giraffe Girl. See the amount of mud he got on the left side, unlike all the others. Not sure this particular one is getting sympathetic with him. Staying very close near his hindquarters. And that's not a good sign. Christian, how long will they take to recover? If nothing happens, if nothing happens from now, I would give it about two weeks. If the bleeding will stop, he'll be in very good shape. Most of the animals here in the wilderness tend to recover very quickly. And what we do as guides, if it's anything natural, for example, predators coming for prey, we rarely interfere. This one have a very itchy ribs. Sometimes they'll have lots of mites and parasites. Just trying to scratch itself. Hopefully you don't bring that thorn tree down. And if you look on the same thorn tree, you can see it has been eaten a little bit by elephant. So that one is a very important tree to the Ellis. And of course, like now it comes in very handy for a very itchy buffalo. Remember your questions are always wonderful to get. All comments using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. These buffaloes are debating how they would maybe get rid of the one that is bleeding because what will happen, it will make it easy for the lions to come back. And that is the guy, that's the victim, who have survived and will have tales to tell maybe a week or a month from today. See how bloody he is? You might think maybe he was giving bath. But lioness is being on their own without a male and I think that's why they didn't make it. Well done buffalo and maybe lions can try again. And the lions here will keep getting closer, closer to this herd. But the Hosanna, the leopard must be up now. He is up and he's gotten up into the tree, so we thought that the sun might get him moving and get him out of where it was, and so he wandered off and he's now gotten into the tree with his kill. And you can see there's still a substantial amount of food there for him. He's done actually very well to hoist this. It must have been quite an effort for him to get it up into the tree itself, so he's done a sterling, sterling effort. There'll be obviously a little few chunks that are missing out of it from the hyenas, but there's still a lot of food there for young Hosanna to have a really good feed today and it's a, it's a decent sized meal you know if you look at it in relation to how big he is he's going to have a few days on here I doubt that this will be finished even tomorrow at this rate you know it's not like he's empty bellied um, the only problem is is that I'm pretty sure his dad will find him at some point in fact the last time I saw Tingana I think it was the last time I saw Tingana was actually walking right here so you know he's does spend time in this area and so you'll find that Hosanna might not be able to keep this one safe from dad once again, but he'll definitely have a good opportunity tonight to have a really good feed. And what are the chances that we find him once again, you know, a week later on food? He really is a showstopper, is Hosanna. He knows when it's TV and he just kind of makes sure that he's available. And yesterday was just his prep day. He was making sure that he was in fine fettle for this afternoon. And now he's kind of going to town. The problem is, is he started feeding a little on the early side, which means he might start to actually kind of have a bit of a nap later, which is not ideal, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. At the moment, he's plucking this carcass as best he can. He's trying to get rid of all that long fur that these guys have on them and trying to kind of get all of that off so that he doesn't actually have to eat it because if he eats that it's obviously not good for his digestive system. Hosanna be very careful because the branch he's got his bottom foot on does not look like a very sturdy one. Oh, what are you doing Hosanna? You had it fine there boy. 
No, we're going to reposition it again. You can see how mangled that carcass is by the hyenas. You can see how it's been stripped along a lot of the joints. Um, so you can see there's, a, there's areas that are completely missing um, with meat. And so they, they've gotten in under the skin and they've kind of pulled chunks off of it. So there's not as much as it, it first looks like, but there's still enough, like I say, to keep him here for a good couple of days. This is a really good meal for Hosanna and he's going to go to town, I think, now. Get his belly nice and full and that way if dad does come and steal it, well, then he doesn't have to worry too much. At least he'll have had a good feed. And I'm impressed that he got it back from the hyenas. I think the thing with the, this morning was that those hyenas were just so full that they just really had no idea what they wanted to do. They kind of had no space left and they tried their best to, to sort of keep Osana at bay but at the end of the day it got hot their tummies were full I'm pretty sure that they were uncomfortable and so they decided rather to try and move it on and try and go and find a better spot in order to go and rest and that allowed a perfect gap for Hosanna to get in so Rachel they're not cleaning the kill before eating what they're doing is they're just plucking off the stuff that's difficult to digest so things like um, fur one is it takes a lot of space in a tummy um, that provides very little nutrients in fact it's, their stomachs really battle to digest fur and so they try and pluck as much of that thick fur as possible and you can actually see where he's been pulling off you see how the skin is being exposed so these little white patches are where Hosanna has taken big mouthfuls of fur off and, and he's trying to get rid of that so that it doesn't basically clog up his tummy and make things a little uncomfortable for him so you, they don't really clean it as per se they just I suppose try and defluff it in order to be able to get to the really good stuff and not waste too much space inside. Hosanna, what are you doing, boy? Is that better? Are you feeling more comfortable now? He's got it well wedged in there. I mean, it doesn't look as though it's going to fall out at all, but he definitely kind of... <laughs> play around with it as he normally does take care yes they'll eat the skin um once they've plucked that fur they do eat skin um you'll find that very little actually goes to waste with leopards they they eat most of what goes on in there the problem is they just don't have the the jaw power to to crunch spines and pelvises and even probably the upper part of these legs will be too big for him and he'll drop those down and things like hyenas will clean that up and take it away and i'm surprised that now that he's up and feeding and kind of plucking away that we haven't seen a hyena kind of wander in from where they've been sleeping but i'm sure they will later this is undoubtedly going to happen you, you know there's hyenas that know that there was a carcass here so they'll come and search and sniff about and then come and lie and wait for the next few days in the hope that bits fall down but he'll definitely eat um, portions of that skin or most of the majority of that skin once it's been plucked a little bit he seems to have got himself in a nice comfy spot to eat now as well if you can kind of see where he's positioned his bottom he's got a little rest for his tail as well and we're in such a perfect angle because very seldom when you've got leopards in trees can you be at the same level as them. You know, normally you kind of have this upward angle on them, but we are exactly eye level. You can see where he is in relation to where I am. There's this big steep bank and he's kind of on a tree that's growing off the bank. And so I'm literally looking straight at Hosanna from where I am, which is absolutely wonderful. So it's a very unique kind of perspective to have of a cat in a tree. And delightful one if I'm honest it's going to be very pretty and once that Sun gets at a nice low angle it should get beautiful golden light on him a little bit later which will be quite nice if he's still up in the tree of course and you never know how long he's going to take to be up there uh, Michael uh, yes I suppose that they are um, you know maybe some of the guides not so much it depends everyone's obviously got their own personal favorites and they they kind of have you know a sense of, of difference amongst us is what makes us human but I don't think there's a presenter that works here or a guide that works here and particularly within you know the wild earth system or safari live system that doesn't have a very very large soft spot for young Hosanna he's provided us with so much at the end of the day that we can't really kind of I don't think there's anyone that sees or sort of frowns down upon him he's really has given every single um, one of us an epic sighting at one point or another and so you know Brent who's probably the hardest when it comes to favoriting animals he he has a huge hot spot hot spot for so hot spot soft spot 
hot spot, soft spot, there we go, um, for Hosanna, where, and so does obviously Jamie, given that she, she saw them growing up, and, and James we know as well. So I think everybody, Sydney, he's also, you know, Sydney says Tingana is his favorite, but I know he likes spending time with Hosanna, and you speak to David, who is out from the Mara for a period of time, he loves Hosanna as well. So I don't really think there is anybody that doesn't. Um, I, I mean, the guides here at, at Juma are probably the same. I mean, they really have provided everybody with so much. And you've, you speak to a lot of the guests that come here that have been a few times. And he's one of the firm favorites that often gets looked for um, by guests that are repeat that have seen him before. They want to see him. And even people that haven't, um, you know, come out here. And he's a pretty famous leopard now. In fact, you know, if you think about how many times he's appeared on big television shows, it's probably more than even his mother in many respects, which is saying something. So he really has become a very special kind of animal. And even though we know that he lives a natural life and, and obviously our kind of feelings towards him are pretty meaningless in the grand scheme of what he has to endure every single day, it's, I, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a nice thing to know that he's become kind of one of these sort of legendary cats already at his early age. I mean, there's not many people that don't know about him that have been, well, one in the Sabi Sands or two that even have come across Safari Live at some point. So he's a very, very special cat in many regards. And I think he's given not only all of you as viewers, but many of the guides in the area a seriously spectacular kind of view into a leopard's life. So fortunate is what we are to have had a cat like this. Uh, funny enough, today I was actually sitting um, looking through old photos for some random reason I found a drive that I hadn't uh, that I was looking for and I came across a whole bunch of photos of with him and Tamba and Tingana on Chitwe Estrip when they had their carcass together and as much as I love spending time with Hosanna I must be honest there was a part of me that was very sad that we don't see Tamba anymore he really was one of the most stunning looking leopards and kind of seeing the two of them together was always such a treat I used to love when we used to get the two of them in one place because they were very different looking but both of them have their own unique kind of beauty and Hosanna is a little bit more brawny and a little bit more kind of I don't know he's got this sort of teenager attitude whereas Tumba has always been a little bit more serious and and but very striking looking leopard and you forget how striking they are until you actually kind of go back and look at some of the kind of pictures that you've gotten of them over time and so I, I really wish if there was one leopard that could make an appearance once more in this area I would really want it to be him I don't have actually any updates on him I know some of you have asked and I haven't heard anything to be honest but I really really wish he would make his way back at some point because he was a seriously good looking fellow and I would be intrigued to have seen what would have happened between him and Hosanna, whether there would have been much aggression or if he would have been much like Hosanna has been in terms of sticking around Tandi and, and even Tingana, although Tandi was far more aggressive to Tamba than she was even to Hosanna in that period where she sort of fell pregnant and had Klalamba, which is quite interesting. But. You know, it would have been so nice to have the two of them around. I, I hope, I hope that wherever he is, that he makes one last return back here for a few days, that we can spend some time with him and see him once more before he distributes out again. But the good news, at least with Tamba, is that he spends some time. He's still within the Sabi Sand system, and that means that we do get, I mean, not frequent. I wouldn't say it's every day, but we do get fairly frequent updates on on him and, and his whereabouts and what he's getting up to. And so so far, so so good for him as well it's been quite nice to know that the two young boys have so far really kind of taken to sub-adult life and and going into adult life very very well so let's see hopefully you'll make an appearance like i say but he, he was a stunning stunning cat and his eyes are quite something the thing about hosanna's eyes is that they're a very kind of different kind of color he's got very sort of orangey eyes which is not that usual in leopards actually you don't see many leopards with this kind of eye color um, you know, Lamula had it before and there's been one or two others, but it's very, very, very few. Most leopards will have that kind of light yellowish color, um, much like his mom had, um, and so, and Tandi and, and, and even Shadow, I suppose, to a degree. But there's very few that get very deep orange, like what he's got, or any of those that get really kind of blue-green colors. Um, those are quite unusual. There used to be a time on Mala Mala where they used to see a few, they had a few leopards with different colored eyes, which was quite something. There was, I remember seeing a photo of one with a brown eye 
eye and, and, and a, a green eye, which was quite interesting. Anyway, we're going to sit with Hosanna. He's going to devour his meal, and so we're going to enjoy his company. While we do that, though, we're going to send you back across to David, who, well, will probably tell you about just how much he likes Hosanna, as well as revel in the fact that he's got some of the cutest little animals that you get in the form of the lion cubs. Alrighty, good to hear Hosanna, the chief of Juma. We got now the sausage tree pride and the two new additions in the prider here but actually apart from these two there's another pair of two younger ones so these old ones here we got so they're about three months old but there's another pair of two new cubs and most likely one of these is their mother now they're both looking at the direction of the buffaloes that we saw earlier that's a big yawn well are you also going to yawn or are you going to yawn two times all righty how contagious is that it's very normal for cats if one yawns for the other one to yawn and what they're looking at is the buffaloes they tried to chase earlier and they were not very successful another yawn i hope your sister yawns too but she's maybe debating how they lost on that kill. I would say it was so close, yet so far. Having brought it down, I think that was the most important task, or the job was almost done. But to lose it when they had it down, that was a bit sad. What I would say is maybe they needed a, you know, extra muscles of a male. In this particular area we are in, there is a male that we call Kipuli, and he's always a very big, strong male, and strong, just like Tingana. I am here now with the Duke of Juma, Tingana, who is showing us something unusual this afternoon. He is trying to stalk the very big giraffe, and I'm sure that is highly impossible. He's not going to win that battle, but it seems like the giraffe is walking away, and Tingana is also now carrying on, moving much more towards that side. I'm just going to keep following him until we have a better sighting, because I can see from where I am, there's too much bushes in between. So we are very lucky uh, to come across uh, my favorite cat, the Duke of Juma, Tingana. I love this beautiful cat. So before we lose him, I'm just going to carry on now, pull forward and see if we can improve the sighting. So let's see. <laughs> giraffe girl, Tingana is looking for some troubles. Giraffe girl, the giraffe can kick. Uh, they, they've they got a very dangerous heavy kick which can break his jaws. He must have to be very careful. So I can see that it's right deep in these thick bushes. So I'm going to find a space to go deep in here so that we can see him nicely. So I can see now it's starting to open up. At least I've got a, a space here to go in. So he is now moving uh, towards this direction. So we're going to meet him at any time. So let's hope he's not gonna go to where Hosanna is and disturb his kill. I can see now there is he. They might find some shade and rest a little bit because the sun is still very much hot. So most of the time Tingana is doing his uh, the walking activities, the patrol activities late in the afternoon. Today I think it's very much early. So most of the um, activities, the patterns of the cats such as lepers, they are much more after dark.
So Tingana's territory is quite very large because he is in charge all the way from uh, Vuyotela Pen is Tingana, you come Buffer Sport is Tingana, you go to uh, Buffer's Wook is Tingana, and he has been introducing quite a lot of different females. That shows you he is very much powerful, and the females are interested on his genes. So these females, they don't f just fall in love with any males. First, they check if they are going to have uh, the very strong little ones. So it seems like Tingana does not have a strong competitor at the moment. He is still very powerful. I saw that uh, not long time ago, in less than two weeks, he introduced quite a lot of, three weeks, he, he introduced quite a lot of different females. So you can see he's now again starting to uh, move towards that side where I must have to keep following again until we get much closer. We are going, going to uh, pull forward and see if we can have a close contact. So what I like about these kind of cats is that when they're moving, from this area to the next. If they see anything, if any prey presents itself, they are going to take an advantage. So it might get very interesting as I'm following here. Uh, Tanya Hosanna is still is very much far at the moment. He's just by the Philemon's cut line. I can say he's approximately uh, two, three kilometers away from here. He might end up there. These cats can walk long distances non-stop. He is walking slowly like that, but on a very short space, he can cover a very long distance. I'm just going to keep following, following until I find, until I see what his intentions are this afternoon. Maybe he's got very interesting intentions for us. He might hunt. I haven't seen him for a while. So we're just going to pull forward again and see if we can get closer. So it's quite very thick here and quite a lot of uh, dead trees uh, knocked down by the big animal, the elephants. So Dave, be careful of the branch there. So we are just passing in between the branches here. stump somewhere here in front which is blocking my access oh we have made it we have made it so I can't see where it is at the moment but it is uh, he is walking all oh, day. He is he's still now getting very far. Now let's go back to Osana, who is having a kill. Indeed, but <laughs> I was just saying to Senzo now that this is not good news for Hosanna that Tingana is around because if Tingana is on site and on property, well, his nose will find this somehow, some way. Tingana is going to end up being at this particular carcass by the end of this evening. I'm sure of it. I, tomorrow morning, if he doesn't arrive tonight, tomorrow morning we are going to find him sitting here with Hosanna. I have this funny feeling that he's going to sniff this out somehow and find his way here. Anyway. Hosanna, in the meantime, is having a good feed. He's crunched through the ribs. He's eaten a couple of ribs and enjoyed those as a little hors d'oeuvre. And now he's starting to get into the really good kind of meat inside there. The nice, really soft, good kind of juicy 
thick pieces of meat and so he uh, seems to be a very happy lad right now. He's looking quite chuffed with life and slowly but surely getting round and rounder. But look at the size of his paws and his claws that are coming out there. It's always nice when you get a leopard in a tree like this because often when they hold the carcass they will flex their paws a little bit and they actually the toes spread slightly and gives you an idea of just how big their paws can be. I mean you work out the size of kind of his head and, and even the size of that nyala and you can realize very quickly how big those paws are. They are absolutely massive in comparison to the size of his body. So he's still got a bit of growing to get into those paws. Um, and his paws themselves will probably grow a little bit too, which is quite something. No, Hosanna, it's fine where it was. You were very comfy and very happy. Don't move it around too much. I always worry when he does these things because knowing him, he'll drop it. And if he drops it, well, it's going to be a lot of effort to get it back up again. But there we go. We got him sorted out. And just needed to get it so that he could not have to stretch too far as he was eating. But look, hey, can you hear him eating? He was chewing the skin there. It might be a bit tricky with the wind, but I'll try and listen for it. And when he starts chewing the skin again, I'll just kind of keep quiet. And maybe you'll be able to hear the shearing of that meat as he uses his con nashals as he tries to kind of go through all of that. No, he's got meat now, so that will be quite quiet. He's not actually going through skin at the moment. Meg, unfortunately, is a bit of a complex for Hassan. He doesn't like to talk about it. You know, he's seeking laser treatment. But, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when you come from certain lineages, you know, hair just grows all over the place and you become very hairy. And he's a bit, he's a bit kind of sheepish about it. So you'll find that he, he tries to kind of groom it and keep it short as much as possible. Goes for a trim every now and then just so that his hair doesn't get out of control because he doesn't want to be a hairy leopard at the end of the day. He wants to be as good as possible well as possible look as good as possible and so you'll find that he goes to the barber quite regularly to make sure he's not too hairy and also sometimes he he tried he dabbled in waxing for a while but that didn't really go very well he didn't enjoy the wax and so now he rather he goes to the premium barber and has his little kind of special cut that he gets that's called the hosana special and he goes along and that's how he actually ends up getting the sort of look that he's got. His, his barber knows him well now and makes sure that all is well and fine. No, a toupee would not suit him at all. He, he once thought about going, he told me once that he was thinking about going for, you know, a mohawk. And then he decided it didn't quite suit his eyes because he wanted a green mohawk. He didn't want a, you know, a, a normal colored spotty one. And then he realized it was in summer because he wanted to blend in with the grass. So he thought if he had a, gray, a gray, green mohawk that he would look rather chic and rather cool and he would blend in better. But we managed to convince him not to go for the green mohawk. And instead he keeps it nice and short. He's, he's a bit like an army cadet in that he, he likes it in a kind of decent way now to be f for real and not joke around as much as we are um, no his hair is not really much longer than most other leopards um, he's about the same really um, it's maybe I don't know I haven't looked that closely at others in comparison to him but his fur looks pretty much the same as most leopards I've seen it doesn't look to be too much thicker or longer than what I've seen on others, that's for sure. He's definitely got at least a normal sized tongue, which is always quite nice because, you know, we know Hukumuri's tongue is a little bit large. Anyway, well, Osana, <laughs> that face, battles to try and eat whatever he's trying to eat with a face that doesn't look like he's really enjoying what he's actually trying to eat. Oh boy, what are you doing? <laughs> While he does that though and looks a bit dopey doing it, let's send you all the way up back to the Maasai Mara and to David with the cubs. Up and it's time to exercise, build the muscles. And you can see these two youngsters here jumping up and down, running, chasing each other in the grass. There they go, running after each other and ideally this is what will happen for them. Maybe another two years, three years from now, when they'll need to go run and hunt for themselves. And the mother is just watching them and, you know, wishing them luck in life. Keep playing. Keep building your muscles. It's drizzling a bit here. 
but the far how it's designed on these carts, it helps to ride always always you know the the rain just falls on your skin it just slides down minimal at any age from four months four months or five let's say they will always be allowed to join in the hunt it's not easy because for example a few minutes earlier or like half an hour 45 minutes ago i'm not sure minamu you had me or you are watching i was talking about this particular pride went trying to hunt a buffalo buffaloes are very dangerous animals because when they turn back or when the tables turn back and the hunters you know the hunters become hunters it becomes very tricky for the lions and they do not want to take any chances and the cubs will remain in a particular place and they are told or given instruction or the message by their mothers stay still so six months they can be allowed to watch and see what their mothers can do now, the temperatures have really cooled down. Oops, that's a very good jump. And she just landed on the back of the mother. Very playful cubbies here. They're enjoying the rain as much as I am not. But luckily I am inside the car and part of my canvas I rolled down. For those who are joining us now, this is the Sausage Tree Pride of Lions. And this is one of the females of cubs who are about three months old. Always five in total when you have the whole pride together. The other four are not very far from here. And they're trying to bring down a buffalo. That's one of the other one. Kathy, I agree with you. And the mum knows she got a lot of work to do. To keep pace with them because they are younger definitely than the mom they are full of energy so for her to keep up with them she'll have a lot of work to do i'm sure you can see on the screen drops coming down and that's the rain that's building up now i think they have gone behind that summit mound and they could be playing hide and seek and that's maybe one of the aunties just watching and lions are very social cats if the mother of these cubs would miss to watch over them, definitely one of the sisters will keep watching. Where are the cubs now? We're going to wait because it's getting a little bit dark and we want to follow or go a little bit closer to them. But let's in the meantime go back to Sydney and find out how Tingana is doing. Tingana is now walking in between the dry trees and dry leaves. No rain here at all. Lucky Mara is having some rain at the moment, which is what we are praying for here in South Africa at the moment. So you can see that Tingana has got a mission, is going to somewhere. So I'm going to just keep following. Let's hope it's not going to where Hosanna is. Because mostly he can pick up the scent from a long distance about these kills. So I'm just going to drive again further until we get him again. So I am just keep following Tingana, who is now heading towards the eastern side of the game reserve. So let's hope he's gonna get to a very nice shade and relax. Ooh. So this was maybe an artifact hole. So these artifacts can dig big holes here and some of them is difficult to see. You just feel when you're on it. So I can see that now Tingana is marking uh, his territory, look at that. So he's every time using the urine, scratching and marking from the back legs. So he's just going now around the termite mound. I want to first see where he's about to go. He's not coming out. So let me rather drive 
and see if he is not relaxed against the termite mound there. Because this termite mound is very huge. Maybe he is enjoying the shade of the termite mound. Uh, I, I can't see him here where I am. So it means he is, yes, there is he against the termite mound. He is looking at something here. Now he's very much relaxed. So at least he's going to use this uh, termite mound for now. So I'm gonna have to uh, pull back and find a very nice spot by the other side. I am not alone uh, at the moment by this sighting. There are some of the vehicles here. I'm just going to try and have a space where we can see this Tingana much better. So now we can go to Tristan with Hosanna. Indeed, we are with Hassan, and we are thankfully not getting the runaround like poor Sydney is at the moment. Sydney is getting taken through a horrible place. I know exactly where he is, and it's not pleasant at all. Now, here comes the hyenas. It wasn't going to be long until they arrived. Don't worry, Hassan, you safely tucked in the tree, and so these guys are not going to worry you at all. There they come. I knew it wouldn't be long until they got here, and it had to be you know, one of them that would arrive first. Is that in Tima that's down there? It looks like her that's arriving now, but I'm not 100% sure through all those branches. Is it her? Uh, might be. You can see she's just below us at the moment, so we kind of parked on a very precarious spot in many respects. I'm hoping that the hyenas do come in and it keeps Hosanna up in the tree because I know how he can be. He will eat now and then he'll go and find a spot just to go and sleep. But if lots of hyenas arrive, well, that'll keep him up there and hopefully he'll find a nice little branch to have a good nap. But it's, you can see, look at how he's breathing. He's jammed so much food inside there that he don't think he's got much space left. In fact, his tummy is getting wider than his shoulders at this stage, which is a bit of a worry. He is in full sausage regalia right now. He's already in his Halloween costume. He's going to go as a sausage, as a little frankfurter this year. That's what he's decided. Kit Kats, well, it's because most of the blood was kind of leaked out of this carcass this morning. So when... Um, Hyenas were feeding, and when we left this morning, we went past where it was actually killed, and you could see, and, and the hyenas first stole it, and there's just this big puddle of blood there. So all of most of it would have drained out already, and that's why we're not seeing it too much. And you can see there's huge chunks missing at this stage, and so most of that would have disappeared during the course of that kind of feeding process and so a lot of the blood is already gone. Just also remember that that carcass has been dangling up there the whole day and so you know it's much like um, I suppose anything if you make a huge hole in it and you dangle it somewhere for 12 hours there's going to be blood that's going to drip out and you can actually see the damage to that thing the punyala's hoof even has been half eaten so these hyenas have really caused a lot of damage all over the place. Wasana, are you watching the hyenas carefully walking away? So your hyenas come to join us up on top here and is milling about behind us at the moment. Shucks, um, I've never eaten Nyala meat like this and I'm not sure whether or not it would be considered tough to a leopard. But I mean, I have eaten a Nyala before, but it's never one that's been kind of in the bush. That's all farmed Nyala, so I suppose it's slightly different. Look at that. Doesn't he look happy with himself? He's kind of hugging his carcass as if to say, yes, you may have gotten one over me this morning, but it is mine. Um, and when they farmed Nyala, I suppose, and, and maybe if it's killed in the right way, it's not tough at all. It's actually a very nice um, meat um, to have. Hosanna, you've got bits sticking out of your teeth. There's, you see that he's got a piece of... Oh, there we go. That's good. Well done, boy. Can't have things hanging out of your mouth. You've got to look good. It's your TV appearance tonight. Doesn't look like he's too perturbed by this um, and so yeah Nyala is actually pretty good tasting stuff it's not the best but it is okay Mrs. Anna he is fat boy slim at the moment look at the size of that tummy <laughs> Hosanna you're going to roll out of that tree he almost looks like that cartoon you know the one where they inflated so that's what he kind of looks like at the moment so now we're going to fall asleep on our carcass enough feeding it's all been too much for one afternoon now he's going to kind of just relax watch the sunset while he sits and eats well sleeps 
on top of his hello boy oh isn't that beautiful see a little bit of the sunlight just catching his eyes as well which is quite nice he is really growing into a magnificent leopard isn't he He's also fill, filling out by the day. And I'm not surprised because his belly is never f empty. He just keeps kind of plowing food in there. And so it's not surprising that he's getting bulkier and bulkier as the day goes on. His head has definitely really got developed a lot since this time last year. You know, this time last year he still had a kind of young male cub kind of appearance where he's starting to sort of seem or seemingly starting to look a little bit more serious and a little bit more kind of bulky and that typical kind of male leopard look about them where they get these massive kind of heads and shoulder areas and you can see a little dewlap has started as well so he is getting to that kind of male leopard phase where they are quite intimidating when they kind of reach that and they look at you and they've got these kind of like I say big shoulders and big neck area always wonderful to see but that is one happy cat I would say at this stage of life come a long way hasn't he it's quite nice when you think about his kind of story and what's taken place in his lifetime it's not been an easy life that's for sure and the odds of him surviving as a male in a pretty well leopard rich um, area like this probably was not very good given he was only a year old but he took to it very well I mean he was within the first sort of three four weeks of um, Karula disappearing he was already starting to kind of kill impalas and, and the likes and so you know he really has done very very well all things considered and you know he's done one little jaunt through the central part of the Sabi Sands and decided now nah, he prefers it up here and has come back and is just taking it easy on this side of the world. I suppose he had a lot of competition down there. You know, Anderson and Flat Rock are not two leopards you really want to mess with too much. Both are quite big boys. And so I suppose it makes much more sense to come here and just deal with dad for a while and every now and then pay him tax in the form of food and then carry on. Most definitely, Vicky. I mean, if, if you know, hyenas make a lot of noise and, and whoop and, and cackle and there's lots of kind of fighting amongst them that can definitely attract um, Tingana's attention. He can hear it from quite a way away and then maybe move into this area. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Um, it could attract attention of many others. You know, where Hosanna is at the moment, there's kind of a fringe area. This could be a place where we could get Shadilu arriving, we could get Tandi here, we could get Tingana, we could get Hukamuri, we could get that unknown male. Um, you know, even Mfakazi wasn't that far away from here when he had his kill stolen the first time we kind of saw him with Hosanna and Tingana. So, you know, it, it's it's not always the best spot for him at this stage. I mean, he's got he will have some competition here, and any noise that hyenas make will attract the attention of them of those cats as well as maybe even something like lions. The Inkuma pride when we followed them yesterday walked right past here. You'll see on the right of this tree, there's a tall tree over there, and the Inkuma pride just walked just behind that tree in that direction. So, you know, he's not kind of off the beaten track if you want to call it that. So, he will have to keep bit of an eye out. Now what have you seen Hosanna? He's kind of looking off in that direction at the moment. No, he's decided that whatever it was is okay. Maybe some hyenas are messing around. That's where the carcass came from. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's maybe a hyena that's just chomping down on a few little bits that are that side. Right, well we'll sit here and wait. We'll see what comes of his attention. Um, and while we do that, let's send you back across to Tingana who's also looking around much like his son. So you can see that Tingana is now heading towards the Juma area. Not too sure where exactly he's going because he's just changing directions all the time. Now he was facing much more towards the Torchwood side. Now he's looking at Juma side. So which well, I'm going to have to turn now so that we can see him clearly as he is disappearing uh, towards the dry, dry river bed. And here is very much thick. It might be very difficult for us to see him nicely. We are going to wait and wait. I can see where he's going might be difficult for us. So maybe his plans are for going to Osana and see if Osana has got something there. And still the food as usual.
The leopards, they, they catch quite a lot of different animals. I haven't seen them catching a fish, but I saw them going after a crocodile and I have seen them going after the insects and also the reptiles. So crocodiles anyway are part of the reptiles. I can see him right here now. He is going much more towards the thick bushes. Look at that. So here I am going to work very hard in order to find him clearly. So I must have to go to the other side and see if he's going to come out now. So I don't want to lose him. I'm just going to keep following. Otherwise, we're going to lose him here because the bush is very much thick. So let me make sure that I'm very close to him as he's moving. So now let's go to James for some updates. Absolutely hopeless I've been today. Driving around like a lost, well, wind in a gale force wind, if you like. We've searched Torchwood, we've searched Chitwa. There's nothing on the radio that's come through. And, well, at least we have a gorgeous picture of the setting sun. We're now heading back towards Chitwa. And Lady Starfire, our SABC show starts in precisely 40 minutes, in fact, from now. And so we're heading back to Chitwa, where we are guaranteed at least to have some hippopotami. I was hoping to bump into quarantine the male leopard or something like that here on Torchwood, but alas and alack, that seems not to be possible. Anyway, it's a glorious afternoon, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. Isn't that pretty? You can see the Drakensberg Mountains there in the background. Stretching some 1,000 kilometers down the escarpment of South Africa. And soon it will sink over there, and the nocturnal creatures will hopefully come out uh, for our TV show. And yes, likewise, I'm all hope also hoping for a last-minute leopard, as many of you are hoping for one for me. That will become the first-minute leopard of the TV show. Let us continue. I seem to be the only one who can't find anything here. Tristan this morning managed to find what he has this evening. Well, I wouldn't say everything. I feel like Sydney's racked up a few more animals than I have this afternoon. I've just been sitting with one animal, really, and have thoroughly enjoyed my afternoon with the little chief. He's been his normal self, really. He slept for a while, and then he was his posed ever so wonderfully for us in the tree. Isn't that just a beautiful view of him? I know obviously it's not so nice to see the Nyala kind of dead underneath him and the sort of internal cavity there and I'm sure a lot of you probably are a little squeamish on that but the rest of it is pretty spectacular. Like I say to be where we are with him in the same kind of eye level is not every day and so he's chosen a spot in this rather tricky tree that's allowed us to at least have a really decent view of him which has been quite nice so I've thoroughly enjoyed my afternoon if I'm honest it's been very very nice and any afternoon Sunday afternoon spent with the leopard is a very good Sunday it certainly beats the Sunday afternoons I used to spend back when I was at school and I had to dread of the thought of having to do homework on a Sunday because I'd left it all weekend and and then had to kind of panic stations, try and finish everything up before bed on a Sunday night. So definitely a much better way to spend a Sunday night is, or Sunday afternoon is to be with a leopard rather than thinking about homework that I hadn't done. Yes, definitely not the Sunday blues. Did you also get that, Emma? Senzo, you as well? On a Sunday where you used to panic about the schoolwork that you hadn't done? Yes, I think we've all been through that. Exactly, especially the, the older you got, the later you left it, and then eventually you would end up, like Emma says, at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to finish things up. 
or you used to think about some sort of excuse that you could tell the teacher as to why you were incapable of doing your homework over a 48 hour period of no school so you know you'd think of things to do i never really used to actually think of too much and get away with it to be honest i never was good at making excuses i used to just get in trouble really more than anything else i was better when i went to high school and primary school i was a disaster and i was not very good at doing school work and those kind of things i'd would far rather have been playing sport than doing any homework of any sort whatsoever school work it, when i was in primary school seemed like a complete waste of time to me it was just time that i had to spend inside rather than being outside playing cricket or rugby or soccer or something like that and so i did not i did not agree with learning yes exactly counting and the alphabet were not high up on my list of priorities of things to be done in a day but anyway <laughs> i suppose I survived as by the time i got to high school it was a little bit better did you leave your exercise book at home every day senzo Yes, Senzo said he used to use the excuse that he left it at home or he couldn't find it. Or I think we all use that one at some point, or one point or another. Uh, funny enough, there was a f we had one guy at school that he did his um, homework the one day, and he was a diligent kid. I mean, he used to get his stuff done and he did his homework. And one of my friends, who was particularly naughty, um, decided that he hadn't done his homework and he was going to be in a lot of trouble. And so he asked if he could copy this guy's homework. And being, you know, a nice guy, I thought you know what no he's not really into it but okay he'll allow some copying to take place but this poor guy did his whole exercise in pencil and so what the guy did is copied it and then erased the other guy's homework and didn't tell him and then when i know it's not funny and we shouldn't be laughing but then when this poor guy went to show the teacher he thought well I've, I've done all my homework there's going to be no problems here and only to open his book and see that there was nothing that was on the page whatsoever and he got into the world of trouble for lying about the fact that he had done his homework but he obviously eventually kind of the teacher looked closely and he could see that it had been erased but it was very funny at first although it you know that poor guy i felt sorry for him in in many respects Exactly, it does feel like something Hosanna might do if he had homework. He would probably be naughty like that and decide that he would rather, you know, somebody else do his homework. He would leave Tumba to do his homework while he kind of goes off and goofs around. Right, now while Hosanna carries on feasting with much glee, let's send you back across to Sydney who's got a rather calm Tingana by the sounds of things. So you can see now that Chingana has got a nice place to rest. He's right on top of the hill looking at the bottom. Now you can see he is the king in this place because he's watching his territory from the top at the moment. So he has been walking for a long distance from the Buffalo Sook Dam to here. But now I can see that he is not thinking about anything. He's just relaxed but he's still listening to what is happening in the area. He always surprises me. When saying he's relaxed, he always proves me wrong that he's not relaxed. Every time he wakes up the head and starts to look for something. So unfortunately, I couldn't manage to see if the stomach is full because when I got here, when I got him, he was drinking already. So I couldn't manage to see him before drinking if there's something in the bellies or not. But something in the bellies, uh, when it comes to this kind of animals, it does not guarantee that this animal is not going to hunt if any opportunity arises. Clifford, leopards are very awesome indeed. By looking at this cat, you can see it's so very beautiful with quite a lot of rosette spots. And then you can see also here where the necklace is, is different from Hosanna. And for Tingana as well, looks completely different. So each one of them has got its own uh, spot pattern. So now let's go back to Hosanna and see how Hosanna is going to close the show.
well, he's going to be feeding his sausage tummy, is what he's going to do to finish up the show this evening. He is going to try and scoff down as much food as he can, as quick as he can. I wouldn't be surprised that he eats himself silly like this, and then he's going to come down the tree and either flop down, or he might take us on a bit of a walk to go and get water. Unfortunately, it's very far away. Oh, hello, boy. Oh, you look so good at the moment. Isn't that cool? Yes, it's tough to eat so much, isn't it? He's just watching where we are. That's very, very cool. Now, like I say, I mean, there's no water's not close, so he's going to have to take us on a bit of a walk if he does want water. But at the moment, he's just kind of staring off into the distance to kind of pose as well as he can for all of you to get your last screenshots for the evening. So he's really kind of given us the best sort of afternoon that we could have asked for. He's chosen a nice little spot in the tree, and we have been thoroughly spoilt by being able to sit here and watch all of that unfold, which has been very, very good. Now, of course, obviously, it hasn't just been me that's been kind of spoilt. It sounds like Sydney's had a wonderful afternoon. David in Mara sounds like it's been epic up that side of the world as well. And then obviously, James with his Ellie's sounded very, very cool too. So we've been spoiled all round. I think all presenters can be thoroughly happy with their afternoon's work. Now remember, we are not done for the evening. You can all participate in our SABC TV special. Um, we will be going live again in about half an hour time, so we look forward to seeing you all there. But from all of us, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll see you a little bit later. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari.